Our guest today is Brainstorm Neuroscience Pitch Competition 2021 finalist, Zulkaida Mamet. She is a third year PhD student in Mike Anderson's Memory Control Lab at the University of Cambridge. Her research focuses on the role of motivated forgetting in mediating mental health, as well as development of instruments to measure thought suppression. Her hopes are to combine her background in engineering, research experience in cognitive neuroscience, and her newfound interest in holistic healing to bring innovative approaches in the management and prevention of our current global mental health crisis. So welcome. Uh, we call her Zuli because we've known her for a long time. She's a good friend. Um, but Zuli, please tell us a little bit about your academic journey, um, your brainstorm project, and why is it important to study and understand memory, especially intrusive thoughts and memories, and what your brainstorm funding has led to? Wonderful. Thank you, first of all, Miriam, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's always a pleasure to see your face and speak to you, whether or not that be virtual or in person. So I'm really grateful um, for this opportunity today. Um, I also just want to take some time to thank everyone who have taken out their precious time to tune in at this moment and those who might be listening in the future. Um, hopefully, I can only hope that this will be somewhat beneficial. Um, so, uh, you've already mentioned a little bit about me, so I'll just briefly kind of brush over my academic journey and focus perhaps more on the project um, that Brainstorm has generously supported. So, I started working actually in the field of human memory, um, starting from the last year of my undergrad, uh, when I worked with a Professor Dan Schachter at um, Harvard. So, I was collecting data for a project investigating the intersection between our ability to perspectively think, or rather think about the future um, with our ability to think creatively. So interestingly enough, now everything kind of tied back together because the project we're about to speak about is also about future thinking in a, in a particular way. Um, so this experience was very influential for me um, in my undergrad, and that really affirmed my curiosity to really dig deeper into the study of human memory. And this is what led me to um, Professor Mike Anderson's memory control lab, as you mentioned, um, and that's where I've been conducting my PhD for the past three years. So when the pandemic started, um, the project that I initially envisioned was no longer possible to carry out um, due to technical difficulties. And so hence, I revived an idea that I've actually put on the back of my head um, to actually think about doing at a much later time. And that was to see if we can improve someone's ability to suppress thoughts, which can then in turn um, you know, induce forgetting uh, of those things that people are suppressing. And this could be um, thoughts about the past, so memories, our current thoughts, um, which, which can involve, you know, our day-to-day -day tasks or even future worries. Um, and obviously my research, uh, we specifically chose to focus on the future aspect. So with the backdrop of this whole global panic, rather, and the worldwide surge in anxiety, it seemed that this was the perfect time to put such a theory to test and, and hopefully with, you know, help people in the process. And so within weeks, we designed this multi-day um, training protocol to teach people how to suppress their worries and future, uh, fears about the future. We got ethical approval and then we began to study. So nowadays, as we know, you know, video conferencing like Zoom is quite ubiquitous for psychological experiments. But just two years ago, um, at the beginning days of the pandemic, this was actually uh, a new territory. It was very unfamiliar, and at least for my department at the time. So actually, with the study, we also pioneered a new methodology of conducting experiments in the department um, as a result, which, which was also really cool. So, so then over the next... I guess over the course of 10 months, um, I interviewed over 200 people um, with about like 10 hours uh, for over 100 of them um, who completed the entire study and also the follow-up that was um, in three months after their previous uh, engagement. And uh, so with these hundred, over hundreds of people, I actually spent you know, all these 10 hours and, which, and got to know them really well. And the results were surprisingly quite encouraging. So the first surprise for me, I would say especially, was that just how many people did not know that being able to control your thoughts is actually an ability that they are able, they are capable of learning. 
um, and actually being very good at. So just within three days of repeatedly um, training themselves on this for over uh, for about 20 minutes, um, you know, people were every single one of my participants were, was able to learn um, how to do this. And in fact, over 90 percent of my participants were surprised at their ability to do so um, by the end of the training. So that to me was very surprised, was actually quite a surprise because, I, you know, as someone who employed this almost like automatically, um, for me, it was quite eye opening to see that participants express to me their own surprise upon learning this skill. So not only were people able to you know, learn how to do this critically, we want to see if this can actually help people, right? So can this improve their mental state after the training process? Um, if you compare it to their you know, mental state prior to training. And so we were able to see that. So for those who, in fact, not only uh, are people better um, with their mental health state after training, for those who continued this on their own without us telling them, um, you know, for after the training for the next three months, um, they actually continue to improve their mental well-being. And all of this, obviously, with the, you know, bearing in mind that the pandemic, you know, worsened and kind of had this whole entire backdrop was 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 there as well. And a lot of the future events that people were worried about um, that, you know, were genuine events that that are related to the pandemic. So. Now it's one thing to see the data, it's another to see people and to talk about, you know, talk to them about how the, this research has impacted their lives. And I think that for me was the most um, rewarding aspect of this whole journey. And it really was a journey. Um, so especially during my follow-ups, for example, I had participants, you know, verbally express just how beneficial they found this exercise. Like I had a mother who was like, I'm going to teach my kids. I'm going to teach my mom. Um, this was so great. Um, and then I had another woman um, who was so moved in her follow-up, she started crying and um, and, I, and, and and of like out of joy of like how much this has helped her because apparently it came at a time that she really, really needed it. It just like exactly addressed the issue that she was having, which was were these kind of constant worries that were, you know, in her head um, while in isolation during the pandemic. Um, and then I had another young woman actually suggested that, you know, everyone should should learn how to do this. And in fact, she she even brought up the idea of an app, which you know, coincided exactly with something that I was already thinking about doing in terms of how do we make this more accessible to the general public. And here we are a year later, having had um, the support of Brainstorm to make this a reality. So um, currently we're about to finish the prototype for the app to be tested um, first in the laboratory by hopefully early next year. And then we will hopefully mod modify it a bit more to be able to make it accessible to the wider public in the future. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answered your question. Oh, Miriam, I can't hear you. I'm muted. Can you talk a little bit about the nature and source of intrusive thoughts and memories? Are those two different thought patterns? And I'm assuming not everybody suffers from them, but can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. So the the idea that's a very good question so the idea of intrusive thoughts um so thoughts could be about the past so if it's about the past then it becomes memories if it's about the present i guess they could be depends on what you're thinking about in the present um or it could be tasks if it, it could be future oriented or um, it could be about the future so it could be be worries and fears, um, you know, various kind of projections that you have about the future. So in, those, in that sense, thoughts can include all of those. But in general, when it comes to intrusiveness of it, what makes it so intrusive is that it, they're triggered without your control. So you're not prompting these thoughts, they just kind of come into your mind. And then the intrusiveness aspect it also is that you don't want it. Like they're not welcomed. Um, in fact, uh, you know, in terms of valence, in terms of your emotional response, at the very least, you might be irked by it, annoyed by it. But at the very kind of full scale, it can be quite, you know, debilitating. Um, and that's when you have like dysfunctions, like PTSD and um, and and OCD and and depression and you know, rumination. All of these like intrusive thoughts is actually quite widespread throughout the psychiatric. Um, mental you know mental health conditions and so in that sense um you can see that it's a spectrum so all of us do experience elements of intrusive thoughts right for example um you know 
I would say like anything like a thought might intrude into your head from time to time. Let's say like you had an argument with somebody, you might think about it. Um, or rather, you might not want to think about it, but it might come into your head. So that's the intrusiveness of it. But um, it's intrusive because you can't do anything about it at the time and you don't really intentionally kind of prompt this thought. Now, some people can just brush it off and that's, you know, then, that, then that's fine. But other people actually experience it at such an extreme level that it can become obsessive and it will keep coming to their head um, to the point that it can be debilitating. And, 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 and that's where, you know, the suffering comes from, right? Um, people who suffer from intrusive thoughts that, and that can, and when that is paired with other things, that's when people, you know, nowadays um, people might, you know, diagnose that as certain types of um, mental health conditions. So that, that's the, I would say, the general scope of the gradient. So it depends on where you are on this kind of spectrum. Um, but yeah. Pat, you're muted again. Fix. What role does the isolation and trauma of the COVID pandemic especially play in increasing these issues? Yeah, so I've, um, this is a very, very important question. And I think this is increasingly being researched. So um, perhaps there will be papers that, that I can point you to, but um, it's not coming to my head right now. Um, but I would say one thing for sure is that you are confronted with your own thoughts, right? Or you have a more kind of opportunity um, or space and time to be forced to be alone with our own thoughts from time to time in with isolation during the pandemic. And that can also force you to communicate more than you ever have to um, with isolation. So these are the times where those anxieties that might be lingering beneath the surface that you've kind of just, you know, uh, avoided. And so this is the kind of, this actually goes into the key aspect of difference between suppression and what people might think is suppression. So suppress, suppress, directly suppressing something doesn't mean you're avoiding it. Um, in fact, you're engaging your focus on the, on the thing, on whatever that is intruding and, 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 and actually blocking it in a very intentional way. Um, so that is the complete opposite of avoidance, right? Whereas avoidance, what it will do is temporarily, it will kind of um, get that out of the, the kind of your focus, but then the thing is still there. And that's where kind of it can come back and intrude again um, and, and you know continuously intrude. That's why when you do um, you know, our task uh, uh, in terms of direct suppression, you do see the intrusion rates kind of lowering as, as, as you keep repeating and training yourself in this task. And so um, what I'm trying to say is with the pandemic, uh, with isolation, those things that you've been avoiding might, that, that have been kind of, you know, lingering um, might be brought up to the surface. And that bring up to the surface is what causes people panic and anxiety and, and perhaps even depression and without any explanation, right? Because there, you have no longer, you've avoid, avoided so many things perhaps, or we rather, we avoid so many things on a day-to-day basis that you no longer, like we no longer know what the kind of the source of um, that anxiety is coming from. So perhaps in that sense, the, the isolation and the trauma of the COVID pandemic did increase, you know, increase a lot of um, intrusive thoughts. And of course, natural worries. Um, and if you have a precondition, um, you know, a pre kind of tendency uh, to have worries, then it can become preservative and, and actually, you know, increase um, dramatically uh, in, in such cases. And, and that's what happened with actually a lot of my participants. And, and that's where this, this hopefully was very helpful for them. Um, at least that's what they've expressed. Uh, can you talk a little bit more generally for those who aren't familiar with how memory, and this is a big, broad question, I realize, but um, in gen very general terms, how memory is laid down in the brain? I know we don't know all the answers to that, but in general, where is memory in the brain and how does it function and how do, how do you come to have memories? And I know that that's, again, that's a very broad question, but can you educate us and our audience a little bit on the mechanism of memory? Um, I can try. So first of all, like you said, this is actually an active field of exploration. Um, the mechanisms have been studied for decades and decades now and we are still they're 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 competing theories um and uh in fact um 
what I study is more the forgetting aspect of it, which isn't, which actually argue isn't necessarily just a lack of remembering. Um, but in terms of how the, the, I can maybe explain like a textbook version of one theory, um, which is the idea that, you know, so it used to be that memories are thought about as ingrams. So these kind of um, traces, memory traces that are, you know, populations of cells, neurons in the brain um, would be responsible for. And, and they're kind of hierarchical in the sense that, you, you know, uh, when you try to remember something, uh, depending on the trigger. So for example, you could be triggered by a scent or you could be triggered by an image, you could be triggered by a sound. So whatever that triggers, it would you know, be triggering um, you kind of deeper layers of hippocampal um, neuronal ensembles, um, which then can trigger the, the, the kind of the whole reliving um, process of memory. And that, that is a lot of kind of, um, that, that will involve multiple um, regions in your brain. And in fact, perhaps some may argue the whole brain. Um, so in that sense of reliving an experience, um, there are multiple things that are happening. In terms of the actual kind of consolidation, so, you know, usually textbooks will show you, like, in order to remember something first, you know, it, it goes through like a consolidation process, right? So it, it has to first be remembered in short-term memory, and then, you know, after some time, it will become long-term memory um, after some consolidation, and that will be like the hippocampal activity. And of course, that is peer, paired with whatever um, it will be remembered with the kind of emotional salience that you came with, right? So if it was like a fear, like a trauma, then you might have some amygdala activity, which is a which is often known for this kind of emotional um, aspect of, of of an experience, and of course, other regions in the brain as well, um, and and that will be paired um, and, and whatnot. So then, and then after that, there's also storage. So then you know, if you look at like the hippocampus in itself, there's actually incredible exquisite gradients in just that tiny little structure where, you know, the tail of, of the hippocampus might be like exclusively for, you know, or rather not exclusively, but um, structured for, for particular um, storage of memory, let's say, or versus, you know, when you're remembering something, it's coming from a different part of the hippocampus and whatnot. So there's, I'm really, really generalizing here, but like, Essentially, what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of um, a lot of structures involved, and the big ones you usually hear about, at least in my field of of memory control research, would be, you know, the hippocampus, which is involved with remembering, but also down regulation of hippocampus happens. So hippocampal activity um, might be down regulated or suppressed, let's say, by your prefrontal cortex when you are trying to inhibit. Um, or suppress a memory from coming to surface, right? So that's the mechanism that I, I, we usually focus on um, a lot in our in our lab. Um, so so things like that. So there's there's the cortex involved, the prefrontal cortex specifically, and if you want to go even specific dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, there's the hippocampus involved, the amygdala would be involved, um, and of course the whole brain will be involved in the sense when you're trying to re-experience these memories. So I'm not sure if that answers any part of your question it, it but it doesn't thank complex. you thank <laughs> you and we we had a question an excellent question come in um, how are you teaching people to suppress their thoughts and how does the active suppression technique differ from trying not to think about something which tends to have a rebound effect Very and is there any overlap with your technique and mindfulness exercises ah. Wow, three very great questions. So the first question, how does it, how is it done? Um, so I can actually just kind of give you a brief like run through. Um, essentially uh, what we do is for every single um, worry that a participant has, let's say that you're worried that, um, you know, that your your mom would get COVID and, and die. Let's say that, that, that and a lot of people actually had this worry. Um, so they would write, like they would come up with a word pair, uh, a word, so a cue word that would be for this um, particular memory that would cue them immediately when they see that word they're going to remember. So let's say they might say like hospital, right? So they're imagining in this scenario in their head, like, you know, they're at the hospital and, 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 and you know, and, it, and their, their mom kind of on their deathbed or something. Okay, so then the cue word might be um, the the hospital right and then the code word would be oh, another word which is a detail of that um of that memory that they're in or rather not memory but of that future um 
scenario that they're imagining, right? So um, it could be in this case, like white sheets or sheets, let's say, or white or something like this, right? And um, the idea is that every time, so we would repeatedly expose the participants to the word hospital and what you're supposed to do when you see that word. And this is where the suppression comes in. And actually I don't give them specific instructions. Everyone come up with their own way. If they're really, really struggling, that's when I kind of give them some idea about what they can be doing. Um, however, what I do tell them is what not to do. So what not to do is when you see this keyword of hospital, I don't want you to avoid it. And what that means is I don't want you to substitute any other thought into your head because very likely the word hospital will prompt in your head the word um, sheets and, and you will imagine the entire scene, right? So what we're trying to do is suppress that imagination and, and how that is done um, would be to you know, your own kind of way. But what we what we say is don't substitute anything into your thoughts. Try to keep your mind blank and really, really try to focus your attention. So it's not about letting your attention flow. It's not about, um, you know, substitute, like kind of substituting another thought into the idea or avoiding the, the, it's more about focusing your attention, controlling your thoughts at that moment, because very likely it's going to intrude. And if it does intrude, it's okay, just really, really block it out. And 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 that's where people struggle because at the beginning it will intrude, like it will all, like intrude all the time and until you train yourself to get better. And so when it is intruding, um, that's when people employ different strategies, but the, the strategy that you don't employ is to distract yourself. So, um, and some people, for example, they imagine like a blank space. They imagine, some people imagine literally pushing out the image in like from their mind's eye. Um, some people just really, really focus your, their attention and just kind of have a blank um, kind of idea. Some people focus on the screen and just try to blank out everything else. So it's, it's, it's a lot of kind of cognitive load activity. So it is a hard task, um, which is why it, it's a proper training. Um, but, you know, it doesn't take that long. Um, and and uh, like I said, for, for ours, it was just 20 minutes for three days consecutively. And by the end of it, like actually by the end of the second day like people were like really really quick, quick at, at doing this and were able to the intrusion rates like really went down um so that's the idea the second question was um can you remind me of the second question sure how does this um how does this overlap with uh any kind of mindfulness practice yes so the mindfulness practice actually uh we did have a question um, th that we added in our uh, about mindfulness, more about meditation rather. Um, there is similarity. There's actually a colleague of mine, um, two colleagues of mine who are uh, who were preparing to run a study, specifically looking at the instructions that we give during our study and comparing that to mindfulness, typical kind of um, standard, uh, you know, mindfulness practice um, uh, prompts that are out there. So. So this is definitely actively a question that that is being done. So I'm glad that it was asked, which also means that the, the research of my colleagues are, um, you know, certainly part of in, in public's mind. Um, so in terms of uh, the, the idea is that it is very similar. There's but it might not be exactly the same. So the concept of mindfulness um, is also about focusing your attention, but it's also more about letting your attention um, like flow. So letting thoughts go in and out right? Um, and not kind of lingering on one thought. So there's there's a control in the sense that you're kind of, the way that I think of, so this is not now more just my conjecture, the thing that, the thing that I think of it, uh, the, the way that I think of it is like mindfulness gives you this kind of broad um, overview and control of your like kind of awareness and it kind of lifts your overall awareness. Whereas what we're doing is we're not just lifting your awareness, but we're actually putting like a focal, um, control on, on a particular thought. Um, and, and I think that is where, you know, mindfulness might overall lift your uh, ability to kind of have a more aware, but also, you know, positive, beneficial kind of mental health state. But at the same time, um, what we're doing is specifically addressing the type of memories and the concerns and the worries that you, and, and so also putting the spotlight on those particular um, types of uh, thoughts. So I would say that's the difference, but it is both of them engage and focus your attention in a particular way um, that might be very similar to controlling 
um, and, and really trying to gain control um, after all. Great. Yeah. I have another great question. Um, how is focusing on a blank space different from distracting yourself from the intrusive thought? Yeah, very good question. Um, so distraction, um, as I kind of mentioned before, what people tend to do, and this is what my participants often default to, um, and that I have to correct, is what we tend to do when we don't want to think about something is to think of something else, right? So when you're thinking of something else, the thing that you don't want to think about is still there. Like it didn't, it's kind of like, like I said, like shifting the light to something else, but the thing is, is, is you know, the original thing still remains. What we're trying to do here is we're actually intensifying the light on the thing that is intruding and really trying to decouple your emotional kind of um, trigger association that you have with that memory or with that thought or with that future worry. And, um, and in that control, that, that emotional kind of trigger slowly, slowly, slowly kind of, um, you know, dies out. Or, um, and so in that sense, it's actually a very, very different mechanism um, or like a way of thinking about something. And so, the, you know, if you keep avoiding, yeah, the temp, so the, the, the immediate effect is the same, I guess you can say. The immediate effect is both of them, you no longer think about the thing. But the long-term effects of, and this this is this would be my conjecture. The long term effects of direct suppression would be more um, long lasting compared to just avoiding something because that avoidance will still bring back the thing. The moment that your focus is, um, you know, somewhere else, um, it will kind of creep back in again, and that's where the intrusiveness comes in. So the training is like building a muscle. Exactly. Exactly. Um, super interesting. And then I'm. I, this is a, a leading question because I want to preface it by saying that, you know, you talked about the pivot that you had to make during pan, during COVID from your original project that you were going to do for Brainstorm, which was on Super Forgetters, but because of, you know, the your because you couldn't meet with people in person, you made this wonderful pivot to, to an, an adjacent project. But can you share a little bit with our audience about the concept of super forgetters? And are those people, like, is that innate? Are, you, are some people just better at it naturally? Um, can you talk a little bit about that idea of super forgetters? Yeah, of course. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a topic close to my heart. <laughs> um, so super forgetters is this kind of idea that there might be people out there um, who are really, really, really good at selectively forgetting negative events from their lives. And, and I say selectively because there are people, we already know there have been plenty of research showcasing people who are just really good at um, who are just really um, good at forgetting in the sense that they don't have a lot of memories to like in storage, right? So people who have very, very few, and those are the people called um, se um, se severely deficient um, autobiographical memory um, types of people where their ability to remember autobiographical memory of their, you know, of relate so basically memories relating to themselves are is very, very low, almost non-existent in some extreme cases. So that's very different than what we're looking at. What we're looking at is people who are otherwise perfectly functional. So perfectly normal, you wouldn't notice, but they're just really good at like remember like not like just forgetting negative things that happen to them right so if you ask them um you know like can you remember the last time you know uh, this happened that that maybe you shared with them they might not really remember the details of that and some 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 of them might be just really good at um forgetting that and so this was prompted by the fact that i'm like that <laughs> and um and this kind of idea that um, this is why for me, it was a surprise when I found out that, you know, not everyone is like this, that this is not actually, you know, like everyone's lives. And so for me, I was really interested in looking at, okay, is it, am I just like an odd case, which I don't think so, um, in the sense that I'm sure there are people out there. And, and in terms of answering your second question of whether or not this is innate versus, um, you know, experience driven, um, I would say most likely it would be experience driven. Um, and, uh, but perhaps nothing is really just experience, right? There's always nature, nurture kind of going hand in hand. And so if you already have a um, particular kind of 
propensity um, or flexibility in, 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 in the way that you store memory, maybe that, that could be um, involved. But I'm not really, we literally have no evidence um, on this to support that claim. Um, however, um, there is the, one of my hypotheses were that um, people who experience trauma um, and those who are resilient after experiencing trauma might be re recruiting um, mechanisms and, and might have recruited mechanisms and abilities to be able to um, very effectively control their, uh, their remembrance of those traumas. And um, because not all traumas are meant to be processed in the same way. Some traumas, when they're forgotten, is the way of processing them. And so um, this is where I think, like, if you actively, like, let's say that, especially someone who've experienced, like, childhood trauma, if they actively try to suppress, and I do think suppression, direct suppression is, is a mechanism to get at this, if they really intentionally to, did this for years, right, or, like, even months um, as a very young child, and at that time, you're very, very good at, like, manipulating, right, and you're developing, and so that can all, almost become automatic, in the in the future um and and that might be where kind of recovered memories might be linked with all of this in the sense that later on in adulthood when you are ready to face you know the the kind of traumas from the past then those things might come back so that kind of control that you've been having this kind of automatic almost control on these memories might be released a little bit because now you know you're ready to face it in maybe perhaps so that's those are kind of the very streams of thoughts that um, led to us trying to characterize people, um, first of all, find people, hunt the world for people who, who are like this, and really try to characterize their um, memory kind of profile. Um, but yeah, so that project is still um, up for grabs for anyone who are interested, um, but in the sense that uh, yeah, so that's where, so so we are actually currently creating um, the lab, uh, we're working on creating an instrument, um, a survey, a questionnaire of sorts, that essentially taps into every single factor that I kind of like just mentioned, right? So tapping into the factor of what are the mechanisms that people use to suppress? And we've actually talked about all, uh, most of them. So we've talked about avoidance. We've talked about direct suppression, which is the mechanism that we use in my study, and also thought substitution. So sub you know, substituting one thought with another. Um, and so what are the mechanisms? What are the, the frequencies? Like, what is the frequency by which people forget things? Like, do they forget all, like, entire events? Do they forget entire time periods, like years in their lives? Um, or do they just forget specific details about particular negative events? Or do they forget negative tasks, right? So these are all quite different types of questions and, and frequencies of each. And then also these phenomena, very kind of particular phenomena of intentional forgetting, like how frequently do you intentionally do something and intentionally try to do this versus, uh, not versus rather, but on, on top of that, this idea of recovered memories, like frequency of recovered memories, how many memories have you recovered and things like that. And relating all of these kind of subscales to these mental health um, outcomes as well as you know frequency of trauma and these things so that is actually the project that I'm literally working on right now um, and hopefully uh, the data will that for that will also be clear so it's all kind of related and and that project is will hopefully be kind of a screening um, for if anyone wants to take up the super forgetter project um, for that, you know, for, for super forgetters, because super forgetters will be kind of identified along these kind of subscales and their profile will might map onto these subscales that, that we're trying to develop um, as a questionnaire. Wow, and so understanding the super forgetters will help you understand the mechanisms behind everything that we've been talking about. Hopefully. Is that fair to say? I mean, that's that would be the goal. That's the vision, yes. That's the vision. Um, we have some, some more. I have more questions, but we have some other questions that have come in. Um, okay. Is the presumed mechanism of effect exposure, i.e. repeated exposure, reduces emotional valency? And how easy or difficult do your participants find it to come up with ways to block thoughts? Oh, this is um, a very good question. And actually, it is very dependent. So like I said, it's really, so I did not restrict my participants in terms of their um, their trauma past history. I also did not restrict my participants, like their ability to, to you know, be a part of the study in terms of um, their uh, 
current and past um, mental health status, which meant that I had a very huge uh, range of abilities um, and experiences and skills. And so um, some people found it really difficult. So I, um, I clearly remember this one participant really struggled and I essentially gave, uh, I had to give like multiple ways like of suggesting how she, like she might actually uh, learn to do this and actually it was very interesting by the end of the second day um she actually like did it and then she was like you know what I think I can do it now and then she, it was like it just clicked but it took her you know essentially like you know 30 20 minutes of the first day and then maybe 15 minutes of the second day um to to get there whereas I had also had participants who like you know, by the, after the first round, so like maybe eight minutes, they were able to kind of immediately pick it up and like were able to kind of do it. It doesn't mean that the thing doesn't intrude, by the way. It's not about like the intrusion might still keep happening until maybe the end of, you know, I would say even until the third day, but the it's more about how quickly are you able to control the intrusion and how quickly are you able to kind of stop it from completely replaying it in your head. Um, so, so that 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 really depended on people's own ability and how hard they're trying, honestly. Because some, some, I mean, this was done online, so some of my participants were, you know, doing it like after work at eight p.m. Other participants were doing it like early in the morning, like right after coffee. So it really depends on how much effort you put in um, in the whole thing as well. So there's a lot of kind of um, processes uh, in play, but I think the beauty of it is that those who, like I said, really kept at it saw the results and also those who without me saying anything kept going and actually used this in their daily lives after even after the study um, were the ones who continue to show um, out improvement in their mental health state after three months um, so yeah hopefully that and what do you what do you teach people to do with attention at the end of the suppression exercise uh, what do i teach people to do with attention Yes. So if they're like, where are they, where do you have them move their attention or do you direct them where to move their attention when the uh, exercise is over? Uh, okay. So, um, no, th when the exercise is over, uh, there's actually like another task, um, or sometimes there's a t another task in the sense that like they might have to do a rating or like a questionnaire, um, on the first and the last day. Um, but in general, it, we just say bye and then we leave. Um, but in terms of during the task though, where their attention, so, cause your eye movement is incredibly important. Um, so, uh, as you, as some of you in the audience might all already know, um, you know, with, for example, with PTSD, there's like eye movement, um, desensitization, um, EMDR that's used as a technique for uh, treatment. Um, we don't really know the exact mechanisms for why it works, but it does work on some people. So the idea is, uh, one hypothesis is that uh, essentially by moving your eyes, you're kind of distract, like you're not distracting, but you're kind of like um, folk de decoupling your emotional um, sensation with the memory itself, because you're focusing your, your, your eye movement is actually creating new um, space for a new memory. So um, this I've actually experienced and other people have told me as well that focusing on something when they memorize something is very, very important, like focusing on a particular point um, with their eyes, because eye movement can actually really uh, trigger um, lack of um, they have difficulties in remembering. And so what I'm trying to say with this is if the question is about eye movement during the doing the actual training itself, I um, very much try, like we really focus, that's why it's on Zoom, like where I'm actually looking at them, like I'm staring at them, what they're doing, um, because we really need to focus and make them focus on the screen, both because the trials are quite short, they're only three seconds, so they need to be like, and they're, they're they, they um, it's not always like suppression, so they need to be able to focus and like really make sure that they're doing the tasks that they're supposed to do, um, but at the same time, we don't want them to be looking at other places and getting distracted, because that's the same thing as, you know, avoidance, right? Um, in fact, when you want to avoid someone, you look away from that person, right? So that that's exactly what we don't want to avoid. We really want them to focus their attention, um, but yeah. That's great. Um, okay, some more really great questions coming in. Um, I want to ask um, Debbie Williams, can you, uh, before we ask your question, can you go ahead and log in with what IPV stands for? Um, then we can ask that question of Zuli. Uh, but in the meantime, 
Um, how we have another question. How does unrelated stress trigger latent trauma and thoughts? Wow. This is a very, very clever audience. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so the thing is, a lot of a lot of our experiences are a lot of our traumas are kind of just linked. Uh, I use this wording before lingering on the surface. Um, so you might think that the stress, so, okay, stress can do two things. Stress can completely lower your um, sense of control, which is, which then kind of just brings everything else up um, and make you kind of more aware of the issues, right? So for example, when you're really, really weak um, in, a, in a mental control kind of state, then, you know, I mean, we see this at, at a very kind of, okay, this is not a great example, but we see this every day when people are like drunk, your inhibitions low are lowered, right? So kind of things just come up. Um, similarly, if you're mentally, cognitively very stressed, then um, what is seemingly disconnected trauma can, can come up. But actually, um, sometimes what you might perceive as it's, it's not connected to the stress, it might be, you just don't know. So for example, we see this in PTSD in a very clear way um, when it comes to and those times people might at the beginning not realize what the trick why they're being triggered but then eventually you know after talking to a therapist or even by themselves they'll they'll start to pick up certain certain triggers like for example um you know let's say that uh, there's a particular person who hurt you um and you have ptsd like kind of trauma from that another person might walk a lot like you might just see someone on the street but you might not even recognize it but then like moments later you you might get this kind of sense of panic um and 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 all of the and, and i have um met people who have this and you might not know what happened but actually it could be that you saw someone who resembled the features of the person that have hurt you but you don't really know right and if you are stressed at that time as well let's say like about other stuff like work stress or whatnot then it will be even more accentuated um, or it can be more accentuated. And so I'm not really sure if I'm answering the question, but I would say there are two kind of what you might see as disconnected stress might actually be a source of um, connection, but we might just not always see it. Um, but that doesn't really help because the end solution is still the same or the and, and um, impact is still the same as that you're, you're stressed and that you um, experience these, these traumas. Now, on that's one on, on one hand. The other hand is also a hypothesis, which is that sometimes the lack of stress or rather the lack of acute stress might give you the time and space for certain traumas to come up. So when you are in a state where you are actually quite well um, and are able to handle life and, and the, the difficulties of life, then those things in a beautiful way um, might come back up I mean beautiful in the sense that now you're it's showing like you're ready you know you're ready to handle this now um, so yes we perceive that also as trauma but now you know your body and you know is created in this beautiful way to be able to kind of protect you it's always trying to protect your mind is always always trying to protect you and so if it has been protecting you for many many years from this particular you know trauma then when you are ready um it might actually come up and 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 tell you to kind of now it's re you're ready to kind of process this so that's actually the complete opposite side um of the spectrum of like lack of acute stress can actually also bring up um some traumas so at the end of the day <laughs> there's always trauma and we have to deal with them um but that's also life so I guess I'm not really making much sense. <laughs> no, that's a beautiful explanation, kind of that philosophical level of understanding, you know, and I love what you said that the body's always, always trying to protect us and that it is a beautiful thing that the body knows when you're ready. Yeah. Um, and I have another question here. Um, is super forgetting comparable to dissociative amnesia around traumatic events? And how does it scale up to working through trauma in therapy? Okay, so <laughs> I wish my colleagues were here <laughs> because I actually have a colleague in the lab um, whose work you might want to also look into. Um, 
uh, Laura Marsh, she's a she's also a PhD student in the lab. So she actually works specifically, her current project is on dissociative am uh, amnesia, but also uh, psychogenic amnesia more specifically, um, which I guess kind of falls under um, what, all of these kind of terms kind of blend into each other. Um, but specifically those super forgetters would not necessarily, I would say, fall into that category. Um, because the idea is that they're per, um, at least the criteria. So first of all, we don't even know that su if super forgetters, forgetters exist, but within the idea that I'm, I'm hypothesizing, um, the idea is that they are perfectly functional individuals. So um, dissociative amnesia is a particular type of condition where, um, you know, it, it can actually, you know, perhaps recover and you'll be like normal, and which means you will no longer have that dissociative state. Um, psychogenic amnesia is also very, um, particular in, in that aspect. Um, of course, some people might have this amnesic effect for a very long time, or some people might never recover certain memories um, when they're under such, uh, such a condition. But um, the idea is that that is a dysfunction. Um, at least that's the way that it's clinically kind of described. Doesn't necessarily mean the participants or the, you know, the, the, the people themselves feel that way. Um, Whereas what we are, what, what, what we're saying with the super forgetters is perhaps these people who are not, um, it's not one or two or three events that, that are like this. It's not about particular kind of time period. It's actually, this is just how they go about life. Like, as in like this past year, they probably wouldn't remember many of the negative things that happened to them. And definitely not from the year before and, and you know, on and on and on. And so for them, it's just, and it's not like when they're experiencing negative event, they, they don't feel emotional valence to it uh, or emotional response to it. They might very much feel the pain and the hurt and the trauma, but it's just that the way that they process it um, is almost semi-automatic in, in being able to forget and dissociate kind of the, the or disconnect rather, not dissociate, but disconnect the, the emotional valence to the point that it doesn't register as a, as a like a full detailed memory. Um, because often memories are very strong precisely because of our emotional response to them um, and, and how that kind of pair, you know, kind of get, gets connected um, when they're being stored um, as a memory. So that's how we are envisioning the super forgetter. So in that sense, um, I would say it's actually quite different than a uh, dissociative amnesia case. Um, but yeah, but who knows, because we don't really know if these people even exist. But yeah. Well, and that's what you're here for. <laughs> that's what your work is for. I um, have a question. How can this technique effectively assist those who have been exposed to trauma, specifically intimate partner violence victims who struggle with rumination? Would different or additional steps be necessary? And I know you're not a you're not a clinical you're not a clinician. Um, so you can't address that from a clinical perspective, but do you have any insight into that? Yeah, um, so uh, you're right. I'm definitely not a clinician. So in terms of whether or not there, there needs to be additional steps, I would always consult um, with, a, with a healthcare provider and a clinician um, on that. Um, when it comes to, so the idea of this uh, strategy or this kind of method is that it can help you on a day-to-day -day basis, or perhaps it can help you on a day-to-day basis. -day. It's not for everyone because um, certain types of traumas are meant to be forgotten. Certain types of traumas are meant to be like integrated. I would say most traumas are integrated um, and that's the way to process them. Um, so, but then what this does really well, uh, hopefully if you, if you train yourself to be really good at it, is to disconnect that triggering emotion sensation. And then the byproduct of that could be forgetting of the specific details of the memory. Um, or uh, in this case, we're talking about memory. So specific details of that past trauma, um, because you're no longer, this, you're, so every time you think about the trauma, it's not, every time it's getting weaker and weaker in terms of emotional response to it, which, which then can also kind of dampen the various details that you remember, especially if you're trying to really control that replay of the memory in your head, right? Um, because often what happens, like the audience, uh, whoever asked this question said, is rumination. So rumination is a very, very big problem, almost kind of um, 
everywhere. It's, it's quite commonplace nowadays, unfortunately. But rumination is essentially replaying the same thing over and over and over and over in your head. Um, and to an extreme degree, especially when it comes to like violent things and, and very traumatic type of, um, you know, salient type of triggers or memories, it can be absolutely debilitating because they can, you just can't work on anything else because you're just kind of like, constantly thinking about this. And, and there's an emotional kind of, reaction to it so it can physically make you tired um and 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 so in that case right what we're trying to do is perhaps this can be helpful in trying to decouple that emotional like bodily kind of reaction um and and eventually get you to a place where you're able to integrate it then um hopefully so it's not meant to at all replace any therapeutic um method rather for those who need it, 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 hopefully we can get to a stage where this is offered as a complementary method um, of, of a therapeutic intervention. Um, but uh, for every case, it, you know, the, the kind of the combination of therapy um, or therapeutic approaches will be quite different. And, and th th that's definitely something close to my heart as well, given that I, I'm very interested in holistic healing. And, and that idea is really all about every single person um, really requires a particular, you know, type of, of care um, and, and method. So certainly not a one end. Um, Oh, absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, this is this has the potential to be a powerful tool in our toolkit um, yes. to be used in conjunction, as you said, with other therapies as part of a whole and as part of a holistic approach to uh, healing. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, and this comes in from Roland. Um, I have applied a thought substitution strategy going from negative thought to brief relaxation to chosen task at hand. I have found the negative thought begins to automatically trigger relaxation before I notice the negative stimulus in a positive way. And he was curious about your thoughts on that. That's actually beautiful. Um, I'm glad that people are finding ways to to see what works for them. Um, that that makes sense, right? In the sense that again, you're kind of in this sense, you're not you're not decoupling, you're associating. So you're building a new association um, to that negative thought, right? So um, when you keep training yourself, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like pairing one stimulus with the other. When you train yourself, when this thought comes to mind, I'm going to relax it in this way. Um, then eventually, if that's strong enough, then it will automatically trigger, it can automatically trigger this kind of relaxation. Um, and which obviously we see uh, from, you know, this personal example uh, by Roland. Um, yeah, so that makes sense. Uh, that's a different, I can, uh, that's a different way of doing things um, than, than what I'm trying, what we're doing. Uh, in your case, you're also not necessarily avoiding, um, but you are uh, associating a particular, a different thing. And that that's actually quite common in um, cognitive behavioral therapy, right? So this kind of idea of um, even, even when it comes to memory work uh, with PTSD work, this kind of concept of rescripting. So imagery rescripting, um, you know, at, at a particular kind of negative event, like hotspot, they call it hotspots, right? At a very hotspot moment of a very traumatic event um, or memory, um, what the therapist will do with you uh, or trauma-focused therapists, what they will do with you is to update that with a, with, um, a, a imagery of something different, um, to rescript it into something, something different that will help you cope and actually be better and um, completely kind of change your emotional response to that particular hotspot moment in your memory. Um, and so this is actually a very proven, very, very proven methodology um, that works really well, um, especially when it comes to trauma. So I think that it's, it's kind of gearing more towards that, um, what Mr. Roland is doing. Um, but yeah, but that's, that's beautiful that, um, I, I would say, obviously proceed with caution with personal experiments, but at the same time, it's, you know, this is the beauty of the human mind is anyone can really try. If you really want to intend to heal yourself, um, eventually you will find ways to heal yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that is a beautiful note to end on and wrap up on. And um, Zuli, we're just thrilled. Uh, Mind Science is thrilled to have played a role in helping you advance this area of research. 
And we would love to have you come back when the app is up and running and, and uh, available to more people. We'd love to have you back and learn more about how it's being rolled out. Um, but in the meantime, I think you've got your, at the tail end of your graduate experience, graduate student experience, soon to be a freshly minted PhD. Uh, we're thrilled to have you with us today. And for our audience, we do programs like this four or five times a year. Just keep your eyes on our website, on our event page. And if you're so inclined um, to make a donation in support of Brainstorm or in support of this webcast series, we'd love to invite you to our Get Involved page. And there's a donation uh, spot there. In the meantime, for those of you who celebrate, happy holidays. And thank you again, Zuli. We are so grateful for you and the work that you do in the world. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank okay. you for everyone who are tuning in. Bye-bye.